presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming today. And as you can see from my slide, I'm going to be talking about sustainable aquaculture and really what that means and how seaweed can be a part of that. Um, so as Colin mentioned, uh, I did my PhD work at the University of New Hampshire and I'm now at the University of Rhode Island. So just a brief outline, I'm going to give you guys a context of how important aquaculture is in the world, how important the U.S. is in terms of global aquaculture production, uh, talk about why we want to produce seaweed, why would we want seaweed aquaculture, what is the status of seaweed aquaculture? Obviously, we don't hear that much about it in the States, but it actually is quite a large industry on a global scale. Um, talk about what's going on in New England, just in our waters here. Also introduce you to the concept of integrated multitrophic aquaculture, which is what we consider to be a more sustainable form of aquaculture. And then I'm going to talk to you about my uh, dissertation work, which was on nori. How many of you have eaten nori before or heard of nori? So you guys all know nori is the seaweed that we use in sushi, so that is how we are most familiar with that. And I was really working on developing species that are native to New England. Most nori is farmed now in Asia. Um, and then looking at kind of where we've come and what else we have to do to kind of get the seaweed industry up and going in New England. So just to give you some context, aquaculture is extremely important in terms of global perspective. So we all have heard probably, if we're familiar with capture fisheries, that world capture of fisheries, so wild stock fishermen going out and getting wild animals, has been stagnant for about two decades. So even though they're trying more, so there's more effort to catch fish, there just aren't that many stock out there anymore. And so the landings are pretty flat. And this, black, this darker kind of blue line is world aquaculture production. So aquaculture production throughout the globe has been increasing about 10% per year for about 20 or 30 years now. And so it currently uh, makes up a little bit over 50% of all of the fisheries in the world, aquaculture production. So it's an extremely important industry. And what are we producing? Most of our production, so we're talking about about three quarters, is fish or shellfish. And that's because people like to eat fish and shellfish. But if you haven't heard of seaweed aquaculture, it actually makes up about a quarter of world aquaculture. And this is by weight. And so I'll break it down a little bit. And we have a few non-food products, mostly uh, pharmaceutical type things. What about the US? The US is a little drop in the pond, not even a percent of global aquaculture production. Anybody know what the number one produced aquaculture crop in the US is? Nope. Nope. It's freshwater. It's freshwater and southern. Catfish. That's our number one crop in the US. It's actually delicious. You should definitely support that industry. Um, but this actually is showing you our, the dollar amount of how much seafood we import versus how much seafood we export. And this line here is the difference. So you have your blue lines, that's how much we're importing. So we're importing a lot of seafood. This is from 2003 to 2012. And this is how much we're exporting, even though we have a huge amount of ocean on either side of our country. So the trade deficit is over $10 billion in seafood, second only to oil. And so with aquaculture, there definitely comes some environmental concerns. So we've probably heard about eutrophication, which is the um, unloading of extra nutrients into the environment. And this is especially concerned in fish aquaculture. So per ton of fish, you can get over 130 kilograms of nitrogen and uh, 25 kilograms of phosphorus into the water column. And so if you're familiar with the aquatic environment, limiting nutrient in coastal systems, nitrogen, limiting in freshwater systems, phosphorus. So this can be a huge problem. Also escapism, so any fish that could escape could go and sort of mix with native populations. That's certainly been a concern for many years. And I put up here fish meal because seaweed has a, play, a, place, uh, a role to play in this. And so fish meal is a component of a fish diet, so the pellets that they're feeding to farm fish, and it's the protein source. And so traditionally, fish meal is made of wild-caught fish, so things that we consider to be low value, sardines, Manhattan, anchovies. So you can see that there's a, some sustainability concerns when you are going out and catching wild fish and grinding them up to make pellets to feed farm fish. So there's a bit of an issue there. <clears throat> 
There's been a lot of research into other uh, terrestrial sources of fish meal, also seaweed sources, et cetera, which I will mention a little bit later. So we have some concerns, but there are some ways of doing aquaculture that are more sustainable. And so in New England, these are uh, representing each state, and the number inside these circles are the number of permits. And so some of this is a little bit out of date. It depends on how, how current the websites are for each state. Um, but this is the number of aquaculture permits in coastal waters. And the gray represents shellfish. And so you can see Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, all basically shellfish producers. There is some land-based production of finfish in Massachusetts and also more recently a little bit of seaweed in some of the southern states, which I will talk about. But Maine up here you can see has shellfish. It has this little blue bubble, which represents finfish. And this is salmon. And this is being aquacultured by a Canadian company, Cook Aquaculture. And then this little green sliver are your seaweed permits. And so right away you can see, okay, Maine, something's going on in Maine. People are really interested in aquaculture in Maine and diversifying aquaculture. And so why do we want to aquaculture seaweed? Well, it might surprise you to know that seaweeds have been used for thousands of years. Of course, these estimates are probably very conservative because seaweeds don't fossilize very well. Um, but we definitely have records, you know, 1,500 years in Europe and Japan, 2,500 years in China. And in 2008, uh, this paper came out, an archaeological dig in southern Chile found evidence that the people there were eating seaweeds 14,000 years ago. So there's a long tradition of using seaweed for nutrition in human diets. But seaweed aquaculture is relatively young, and it's relatively young because we haven't had a true understanding of how to control the life histories of seaweeds. In the 17th century, um, they started to aquaculture or pseudo aquaculture in Japan, China, and Korea, and they're basically taking advantage of natural populations. So they'd say, oh, we want more nori. They would go and throw a bunch of artificial structures in a bed of nori to encourage more settlement so that they could get higher production. But these modern cultivation techniques really started coming on in, in the 1950s. And that's true for basically all of the commercially produced seaweeds. It's especially true for nori, and I will explain a little bit uh, why that is. So what are seaweeds used for? How many of you think that you've used a product today that has seaweed in it? You guys should all be raising your hands, and it'll become clear soon. So sea vegetable means you're directly eating it, so sushi, seaweed salad, etc. Phycocolloid, so that is a word. Um, these are your phycocolloids here. There are three main ones. They come from different groups of seaweeds, alginate, agar, and carrageenan. How many of you have taken microbiology? No one? Anybody heard of agar? So it's what you, you make an agar plate to grow bacteria on. That is a cell wall constituent of a red seaweed. Carrageenan, anybody heard of carrageenan? Anybody like ice cream? Anybody like toothpaste? Carrageenan is in a lot of things. So these are thickening agents. So ice cream, non-dairy creamer, um, pudding. It's the thing in pudding that makes the pudding solidify. Jello, toothpaste, shampoos, you name it. You can also make paper out of seaweeds. Obviously, there's a cosmetic industry around seaweeds. Uh, recently, Dove actually released a line. I think it's called Rejuvenating. It says right on the bottle, it contains red algae complex. So there you go. Uh, biomedical applications, dissolvable stitches. The protein source in that comes from seaweed. Animal feed and supplements. So a lot of dairy cows are given kelp as a supplement. A lot of other livestock. Crop enhancement, if anybody's a home gardener, you might have seen liquid fertilizer that's comprised of seaweeds. A fish meal alternative. So I mentioned the issue of fish meal earlier. There are some seaweeds, including nori, that can be up to three quarters of their dry weight is protein. And so there have been a lot of studies recently also looking at terrestrial plants, soybeans, and some of the other high protein um, sources to be able to replace the fish part of that fish meal. And it's been quite successful. And then nutrient extraction, and so this is important both in integrated multitrophic aquaculture and also in just land-based, or sorry, coastal systems where you have excess nutrients. So seaweeds obviously are going to take up nutrients, that's what they need to grow, and they turn it into biomass. So you can remediate or bioextract nutrients from a water column that has too many nutrients, 
or you can grow seaweeds alongside your fish in an aquaculture system as a way of remediating their nutrients. And so just to give you a perspective, even though we don't think of seaweed aquaculture in the US, it, this is a very large industry. So in 2012, 24 million tons of seaweeds produced on a global scale. And this is about six, six and a half billion dollars valued at US billion dollars. Um, 33 countries produce seaweed, but the vast majority of production is limited to eight or nine countries. And you can see China and Indonesia, over 80%, the two of those combined. And so your biggest crops are shown here. This is in terms of weight. Uh, Capophycus and eucuma right here. These are actually red algae. The picture looks green, but that's just because they're in very nutrient deficient water. That's a farm in Indonesia that I visited a couple years ago. Uh, this one up here, this is grasslaria. That's your source of agar. Nori, which we like to eat. And kelp, which we like to eat as well. So you can see here that we have carrageenan. That's probably the biggest in terms of weight. And then there are two bars for kelp. If you put them together, you'd probably get a little bit more than that. And then your agar is here, and nori is here. So nori is produced quite a lot. What about seaweed aquaculture in New England? You might be surprised to learn that this is actually going on. So red and brown seaweeds mostly. We've been focusing mainly on kelp, because kelp is easy to grow. Um, Ocean Approved in Portland, Maine, the first commercial scale seaweed farm in the US, established in 2006, 2007. These farms here um, are all shellfish farms that have now started to incorporate kelp into their systems. So you can see some in Portland, Maine. Also, uh, we have one now in Jamestown, Rhode Island. And there's one in Brantford, Connecticut. And then DULCE, which is, has anybody ever heard of DULCE? DULCE is, the scientific name is Palmaria. It's a red macroalgae. It has a very strong flavor, and they eat a lot of it, certainly um, up in Nova Scotia, up in northern Maine. Um, it's in a lot of foods. And so I've sort of pointed out here that these are shellfish farmers that are incorporating seaweed. And so now I want to introduce to you this concept of integrated multitrophic aquaculture. So what this means when you break it down, integrated, you're growing multiple things together, multitrophic, so they're from different trophic levels. Obviously, a seaweed is a primary producer, or a primary producer and you have consumers, either shellfish, secondary consumers, fish, et cetera. And so it's seen as a more environmentally sustainable way of aquaculture because you can couple the waste production of your fed crops with the nutrient extraction of your other crops. And so these can be land-based or coastal. So there's a very large coastal IMTA system in uh, Nova Scotia that has salmon, blue mussels, and kelp all growing together. And there are land-based systems that are quite large in Europe. So it's been done in multiple places. But it's sort of just catching on in the US. And so if we're using fish, because fish produce a lot more nutrients than shellfish, even though the, the systems we have in New England are mostly shellfish based, what the basic concept here is that you're giving these fish some sort of nutrient. You're giving them pellets, and they're producing solid waste, and they're producing these sorts of things that are dissolved in the water column. So these are inorganic nutrients dissolved in the water. And so in a land-based system, you have it recirculating. And these inorganic nutrients, as well as the solid waste, are going to go into a filter, so like a sand filter that's going to actually filter out big particles. So that's, your solid waste is going to end up staying there. But your inorganic nutrients are not. And so if anybody is familiar with fish physiology, this compound here, ammonia, is highly toxic to fish. They do not like ammonia. So in a traditional recirculating system, you generally have a biofilter, which is composed of bacteria that convert ammonia to nitrate. So it's a different form of nitrogen. Still isn't great for the fish, but it can accumulate in much higher concentrations before you have to change the water. However, if you replace your biofilter with a seaweed filter, these inorganic nutrients are the exact things that seaweeds need to grow. So they're photosynthetic. You add some light, and they will take up those nutrients and produce oxygen, which, shockingly, the fish need to live. So we've taken up the waste that the fish don't like, and we've produced oxygen. And generally, we do this in multiple steps. So most systems have either two or three seaweed tanks, because the first tank, just from flow dynamics, is not going to take up everything. So some of those nutrients are going to make it onto the next tank. We add light again, 
And again, you get some more oxygen, which makes the fish very happy. And so that's sort of the conceptual model of an IMTA. Now, there are multiple forms of IMTA. You can incorporate sea cucumbers, et cetera. Um, but this is sort of how we've conceptually thought of how, how we can make a sustainable aquaculture system, in particular with fish, because fr fish is a re really important protein source for a growing human population. And so I already mentioned the shellfish farms uh, that are starting to grow seaweed, but just to give you a sort of example here, so this, this was kind of the first example of an actual IMTA in New England, and this was incorporating kelp into a mussel farm in Maine. And so this guy here, this is Paul Dobbins, he actually owns Ocean Approved, which I told you was that first commercial scale kelp farm in the US, and he has been helping people grow kelp. So he actually, even though it is his business to grow and sell kelp, he actually has a manual online on the internet and he does workshops to teach other people to grow kelp because he wants people growing seaweed. It's the marketing part that he keeps sort of proprietary. His products are proprietary. But this is him working with a mussel farmer uh, whose name is Matt Moretti, a good friend of mine, up in Portland, Maine, to grow kelp. And so he's been growing kelp on his mussel farm for about five years now, and he sells it as well. He doesn't produce it in as much biomass as, the, as Ocean Approved does, but he sells it to local restaurants and things like that. Um, Thimble Island Oysters in Brantford, Connecticut. So this is a, an oyster farmer. He was actually featured on uh, National Ge Geographic and in the New York Times. And he is also pushing integrated aquaculture. So he's obviously producing kelp. He's been growing kelp for quite some time down in Connecticut. And he, again, sells it to a lot of places in New York City. So they sell them to mostly restaurants. And then this is very recent. So November of last year, Rhode Island got its first kelp farm. So this is a oyster farmer again in Jamestown, Rhode Island, who has uh, started to grow kelp with the help of some people down at Woods Hole Oceanographic on his farm. So he's just starting now, and we'll see what, where the future brings us. But one important thing I'd like to point out now is that kelp, uh, for those of you that aren't familiar, it's a brown seaweed. It is a cold water seaweed. It grows in the winter. So when you plant kelp, you're planting it September, October, it grows very quickly, but your last crops are kind of coming out of the water end of May, early June, because in the summer it gets fouled by everything, tunicates, invertebrates, bryozoans, and it doesn't do that well. So it starts to kind of lose its tissue, so you're losing biomass and you, you don't grow it then. Um, so if you're producing kelp, you have kind of a window of time that's maybe five or six months long where you don't have any crop in the water. And so because of that, and because we're experiencing ocean warming, which is a concern for people that are growing cold water crops, um, there's been a push to kind of diversify the seaweed industry in New England. So we've put a lot of effort into doing kelp, and now we have kelp in multiple states, and now we need some sort of other crops that are going to either fill in the window during the summer when you don't have anything in the water, or just add an additional crop that you could produce sort of year round. And so that's where Nori comes in. And so Nori is, I put dollar, dollar, dollar side because it is the most economically valuable seaweed in the world by weight. So it commands the highest price per weight because it is used as sushi. Um, it's found globally in temperate waters and its primary use is, as I said, sea vegetable, but it's also a source of phycoblins, which are the pigment that are unique to red algae and cyanobacteria. And those are actually used in a lot of biomedical applications as fluorescent tags and so forth. Vitamins, more vitamin C than orange on a weight-to-weight -weight basis. And the essential element, taurine. So it's a very good source of taurine. It's also ideal because it grows fast. It has very high rates of nutrient uptake, very high photosynthetic rates, and a very high protein content. So if you're looking for something that you want to grow quickly in unison with other things for nutrient extraction, be able to incorporate into your fish meal, this is your thing. You want to grow nori. Now, prior to about maybe 2005, we thought we had two species of nori in the Gulf of Maine. Turns out we have something like 19. But because they look genetically similar, we couldn't really distinguish them until we kind of got into the genetic markers of it. And so people had been working on nori for a while, but it turns out they were probably working on multiple species and their results weren't reproducible because we couldn't tell them apart. 
And you still can't really tell them apart without DNA barcoding. They now split one genus into eight genera, nine, nine, it's nine genera now. So there's a lot of genetic diversity within this group. So when I came in to do my PhD, having, we now have the tools to tell the species apart. So I decided, okay, let's pick a couple species that are native to New England and let's figure out how do we grow them. How do we grow them and how can we get people to incorporate these into their aquaculture settings? And so if you want to grow something, you have to understand the life history. The life history of nori is extremely complicated. It don't pay a lot of detail to all of this. Suffice it to say that um, this is what you want, right? You want the blade so that you can eat it in sushi. In order to get the blade, you have to go through all of these little steps. And each one of these steps requires an environmental trigger. And each species, environmental triggers are different. So it's extremely complicated to go through this life history um, and we have to figure out how to do that for each species. Now, after saying that, we have one major advantage in the Northwest Atlantic, and that is we have a species, Porphyra umbilicalis, which only reproduces asexually. So it produces neutral spores and they grow back into gametophytes. And so you can see that that simplifies production of seed stock considerably. And this species is present on the British coast and over in Europe where it reproduces sexually. So we don't really have a good grasp on why it's not reproducing sexually here, but it doesn't. And people have been looking for it to be doing that for a long time and we have found no evidence. But there are some drawbacks to working with a species that reproduces asexually. In theory, it will be clonal. And so if something came through a virus, a fungus, that it was susceptible to, you could kind of wipe out everything. Well, it turns out uh, we recently published this paper looking at genetic variation in Porphyra umbilicalis. And this is the coast of Maine here, and you have New Hampshire down here. And these different colors represent different genotypes. And so even though it's an asexual population, there's a lot of genetic variation here. So that's a good thing. So we can produce seed stock very easily, and we have some genetic variation, so we have some ability to do stra uh, strain selection, so we can select things for different growing habitats. And we also know that we can have some variability in our crops so that we're not putting all of our eggs in one basket, so to speak. And so my dissertation work really focuses on these, uh, these top two, this third one I'll touch on briefly, which is, like I said, developing local species, and then this one was a big one, coming up with a reliable and consistent supply. And so for Porphyra umbilicalis, we know we can produce blades from blades, but it's not, they don't necessarily release spores year round. So you can't necessarily count on going out and getting a blade and always getting spores that are viable. And so one of the things that I did um, to address that, so this first one, basically, how do we grow it? How, what's, what conditions does it like? What are the light conditions? What are the light days? How fast can we grow it? What is the quality of the tissue that results? And the second one, I was interested in seeing whether you could produce spores at a single time point when you can produce millions at a time and then freeze them for use later throughout the year. So there are two advantages to that. One, you have a backup supply. And two, you can severely limit your um, infrastructure in terms of nursery. So it's really expensive to keep a nursery going because it has to be sterile and all of these things. But if you could kind of pr produce them all at once and then freeze them and use them throughout the year, that might be a good incentive for people to sort of work on the seaweed. So that was the second thing I did. So going into the science of how I figured these things out. So I, I basically, uh, to determine how what the optimum conditions were, I ran these uh, split, split, split plot experiments where I was looking simultaneously at all these factors. So I had three temperatures, four light levels. So it, for those of you not familiar with light levels, if you went outside right now on a sunny day, the light outside is probably about 2,000 micromoles of photons per meter squared per second. So you can see this is inside. So these are considerably lower. But um, photosynthesis is saturated at about 110 for porphyra. And then photo period, what that means is how many hours of light in a day is it getting? So you have a long day, 16 hours of light, 12 and 12, or a short day, so you have eight hours of light. And then I'm, I did, the, so I cultured these for four weeks, and every week I measured their growth rate, 
and their photosynthetic efficiency, which is just how efficiently they can use the light they're receiving. And then at the end, I harvested them to look at their pigment and protein content, because remember, pigment is an important determinant of the quality of nori. The darker it is, the more money it commands on the market. And protein is important not only for human nutrition, but also if you're interested in using it as that fish meal replacement. And so uh, this is sort of the design. I have these growth chambers. I have three growth chambers. Each one is a different photo period, so the different hours of light in the day. And inside each chamber, you have six water baths. Two of them are at 10, two of them are at 15, and two of them are at 20 degrees Celsius. And then if you can see here, inside each water bath, there are four flasks, and each one of them is individually wrapped with a filter that cuts down on the amount of light. So you have unwrapped, and then uh, this one is 50%, and then you have uh, down to 60 and 30. So I wrapped a lot of speakers during my dissertation work. I can say that. And so here are some of the results. So this is always going to be growth rate for the next few graphs. These are your photo periods, so short day, neutral, and long. And this is your light level. And so this should surprise nobody. The growth rate increases with the amount of light you give it. They're photosynthetic beings. Of course it does. And the, they do best when they're getting a lot of light in the day, 12 or 16 hours. So this is not shocking. This, this is a good thing. We would expect this to happen. But keep in mind, try to keep in mind this growth right here, how little the ones at 30 are growing. That'll become important later on. So they're hardly growing. So up here, you're talking about 10% a day. That's very quick. They're doubling in only a couple of days. And so just to give you an idea of what these look like, so this is full light, and this is the 30 micromoles. So there's a huge difference in the size of these blades at the end of four weeks. And this is growth over time. So you have growth rate, and remember I said I measured it weekly, and these are actually your temperatures now. And so if you just look at these gray bars, you see on week one to two to three to four, it's going down over time in each of these temperatures. And they're generally always doing better at 10 or 15. These are cold water species. They don't like to be at 20 degrees for a long time. So 20 is generally always a little bit lower. But it's important to know that their growth rate is decreasing over time so that you can, uh, you can kind of decide when you're going to harvest them because you don't want to leave them for a long time if it's just decreasing and decreasing and decreasing. And so FEFM, this is that photosynthetic efficiency. And this, so this is how, how well they're using the light they receive for photosynthesis at the different light levels and the photo periods. And what you can see first is that they're all sort of at the same level. So there's very little difference here. These are intertidal species. They're very robust. They can kind of handle a lot of situations. But we do see at these high light levels, remember I said that photosynthesis saturates somewhere around 110. Uh, you see in the long day ones, so the ones where they're getting the most hours of light in the day, they're suffering a little bit in terms of uh, photosynthetic performance. Bicoblins, so those are those pigments that are unique to red algae and cyanobacteria. They're valuable in terms of biomedical industry, and they're also how well you grade the nori. So the best nori in the world is black in color because it has so many pigments. So this is the concentration. So we're looking at light level. This is a concentration of one of them. There are two different uh, phycoblins. They both have the same pattern. And photo period here. And so if you just compare the bars, so these are between the photo periods. At these low light levels, there's no difference between them. So it doesn't matter how many hours of light, if they're getting a low light intensity, it's the same. But when you get into these sort of saturating fields, you see that the ones that are getting less light in the day have significantly more bicoblins. And so remember, I told you, I told you to remember the uh, 30, the low light, how, how well they were growing, which is not well at all. That sort of creates a conundrum here for people that, are, that want to have high bicoblin content, right? Because Short day is not, is, it's not good to grow them under short day because they grow a lot less. But they have a lot higher pigment. So there's sort of a balancing act that you have to play here, which will come more into um, perspective in a minute. And the protein, which is critical if you want to use it as a fish meal or as a high quality food product. And we're seeing here, again, light level. So we have this 30, which they're barely growing at 30. 
extremely high protein content. So if you want high proteins and you want high uh, pigments, you want to grow them under a short day, low light level amount. But that's, it's going to take you three years to grow a piece of nori because they don't grow quickly under those conditions. And so uh, just to summarize, and I'll kind of hit on that at the end, optimum growth 10 to 15, greater than 110, and greater than 10 hours of light in a day. And so growth is increasing with light level and photo period, which is not surprising, um, but decreasing over time. So you would want to kind of harvest them at maybe a three-week, four-week period, because you saw how big those blades were at the end. <clears throat> the photosynthetic efficiency decreases a little bit with light level, but probably not that important. And then pigment content is highest under low light and protein content too. And so that's kind of where this comes in. And so we, we did a few sort of experiments that were just pilot scale to test whether you could grow them under the optimum conditions and then kind of turn the lights down at the last minute to see if they would bulk up. It turns out they probably, they do that pretty quickly. And so you would probably want to have a finishing off period at the end where you would accumulate the protein and the pigment levels. So you've grown them really quickly and then you put them under a circumstance where they can kind of bulk up for market value. And so that's what we hypothesize is going to work in the future. Okay. And so kind of switching over to, how am I doing on time? I don't know what time it is. Doing good. Okay. So switching over to the freezing um, study. So this experiment actually, my dissertation advisor told me not to bother to do this because it was a bad idea and it wasn't going to work out. And he was, he was surprised in a good way. So this actually ended up probably being the most interesting part of my dissertation, even though I, he didn't really want me to do it. So that just goes to show you, you should always question authority. Um, so what I did here is, I, again, I cultured these blades from, from uh, wild parents, and I had three different treatments. So I dried them out. These are intertidal algae, and a lot of studies have shown that the survival of freezing is related to drying out because if you don't have water inside of your cell to freeze, you have less of a chance of getting um, crystals that form inside. If you have intracellular crystals, you're dead. There's no surviving that. And so I dried them out. These are equivalent, 5% is four hours on a like, lab bench, just at room temp, and 30% is about 30 minutes. So these are only one cell layer thick. They dry very quickly. And then I froze them at two temperatures, so a minus 80, for those of you that work in a lab, that's an ultra-low freezer. Those are really things that we have in research, but maybe not on a commercial-scale aquaculture farm. But this minus 20, that's a household freezer. And then I froze them for one, three, six, or 12 months. And basically, what I wanted to know is, A, will they live? And B, will they grow? And do they have a reduced grow growth rate? And so following freezing, I immediately plunged them back into seawater at the same temperature in conditions that they were being cultured at prior to being frozen. And I measured their growth rate weekly over four weeks in this photosynthetic efficiency. So I measured it twice, once three hours to see sort of short-term, what was their short-term recovery? And then again, four weeks after I dried them. So to give you an idea of what this looked like, so these are little tiny blades because we want to, we want to freeze the seed stock. So each one of these cuffs has a little blade, and they're just sitting there drying in the air. So that's how I dried them. I weighed them, I dried them, I weighed them again, and then I put them into like a microcentrifuge tube, like a one and a half mil Eppendorf tube, with nothing. I just popped them into the tube and put them in the freezer. And then after their frozen time, I would take them out. And so when they came out, they're all being tracked individually. So this was kind of the height of that experiment. I had like 135 blades that I had to weigh individually every week. Um, so it was a little chaotic, and it might have been a fire hazard, but I don't know. And so here, here's the kicker. Every single one of those blades survived. So, and this is shocking. Like, what can you put in a minus 80 freezer for a year, and it's fine? Not that many things, especially without some sort of glucose or some sort of cryopreservant. And it's kind of hard to see here, but you can see maybe a little bit. At, this is the base of a blade. You can see it's got a little white there. So there is a little bit of cell death that has occurred. But the question was, is it going to matter? Will it still grow? It turns out it will still grow. Um, 
So this is the growth rate of those blades. Minus 20, that's a regular freezer. Minus 80 is an ultra low. And the two water contents. And you can see very little difference between these. And so this is lumped together all of the time points. I'll break that out in the next graph. And so there is a, statistically different, a statistical difference between these two here, but it's pretty small on a practical level if you're thinking of aquaculture production, not even half a percent. Okay, looking at time of freezing. So this is, I still haven't quite figured out what's going on here. I'm not sure I ever will. But this is one month. And so actually it turns out that the ones that were frozen for three, six, and 12 are doing better than the ones that were frozen for one month, which I'm not sure that, I haven't come up with a reason for why that is yet. There's some sort of short-term response that's happening here. But these growth rates are equivalent or exceeding the growth rates of blades that were never frozen. So this is truly, this is cool. I don't, this is why seaweed is awesome and everybody should love it. And so looking at the FBFM, so this graph, these aren't the greatest quality graphs, but this graph here is after um, three hours of rehydration, and this is after four weeks. And so you can see this, these bars are almost at the same level. These ones are a little bit higher, but after three hours of rehydration, no matter how long they're frozen, 12 months, they've almost fully recovered their photosynthetic ability. So, I mean, these, these are never going to freeze for 12 months in the wild, maybe for a day or two. But it, this is pretty impressive. And so just to summarize, 100% survival, the photosynthetic efficiency and growth rates are similar, actually exceed those of blades that were never frozen. Um, and no practical difference between freezing temperatures. So this is a viable method of storage for at least a year, probably longer. I only ran it for a year. Um, and we, you could certainly do it in a commercial freezer. So this is a method that can definitely be used by commercial aquaculture operations to limit the hatchery cost um, and also keep a backup supply of this seaweed. And it does not work for all species of nori. I tried it on some other ones. Um, okay, so just to revisit this briefly. So these two things, I, I did some other species of nori in my dissertation for the sake of time. I'm just focusing on umbilicalis. Um, but that kind of leaves us with this sort of infrastructure and market development issue. And so I sort of wanted to point out um, Obviously, we've made a lot of progress. We know how to grow it. We know what to grow. Um, and we know how to preserve it, which is really important to get people to take it up without having to risk that much, because they know they can have a backup supply. So there, the grow out phase in harvesting, they are working in the state of Maine. The state of Maine has really been a leader in seaweed aquaculture. And they are doing some um, grow out phase type things with nori, both in, on land and in the ocean. And they actually, to my knowledge, are the only state that's working on economic stuff. So they actually have brought together a consortium of people to try to deal with how to market products and do a taste test with the public um, and how to package it. And they have some facilities that you, as, as a private citizen, can go and kind of process your seaweed at. And so these things are happening. They're in their infancy, but they are happening. And they need to happen because you can't, we can grow it, but if you don't have something to do with it after, then that's a bottleneck. So making progress there, um, but there's more to come. So I would say seaweed is definitely in the future, especially in New England. So this is actually a um, shellfish farmer who gave up shellfish farming and went full-time seaweed farming in Maine. And this started about two years ago. And so you can just Google Maine seaweed and you will see like the number of companies that have popped up in the past two, three, four years is incredible. And I also wanted to mention that um, the state of Maine recently got a $20 million EPSCOR grant that to found the Sustainable Aquaculture, uh, Ecological Aquaculture Network, which they are investing a lot in IMTA technology and mapping the coastline to figure out where to grow these things in seaweed. Um, so this is definitely actually coming to fruition after many years of people trying to push for aquaculture in the states. And so I will finish there with um, some acknowledgments of funding and collaborators um, across New England. And I will take any questions that you guys have. Questions? Oh. 
Oh. <laughs> um, did you try to eat any of the seaweeds you frozen and then unfro and then we grew? Yes. So actually, I'll go back to this picture. I threw this picture in because I I like it, but also this picture here. This is a drying oven. So these are all my cultures, kind of at the end of my dissertation, and my advisor wasn't going to take care of them anymore. So I was like, you know what? These look pretty good. So I dried them out, and I made little packets, and I gave them to my family and friends, and I ate them. And I think they're good. My dad liked it. He said it was good. So. Did you look at any kind of the effect of temperature fluctuations, as in if there's like a really high fluctuation in temperature? I don't really know how it varies seasonally or what's predicted with climate change, but I wonder if if there's maybe an environmental cue mm -hmm. for when seaweed reproduces sexually. I don't know. I was just curious if you looked at fluctuations. Uh, I did not look at fluctuations. Most of the um, cues to go through that life history are based on photo period, which is obviously a seasonal trait, and somewhat on temperature. So I didn't include it in this talk, but the traditional nori is obviously aquacultured on in mass scale in Korea, in China, and Japan. And they are doing it through sexual reproduction. So they kind of do it, they keep it in a land-based system year round, where they basically, I wish I had the pictures in here, but let me go back to the life cycle. Um, Where's the life cycle? There it is. So they basically take blades that are already reproductively mature and you can stress them out. So the way that you get any organism to reproduce is to stress it out a lot. And so what you do with nori, and it's really reliable, it's true, right? It makes sense, it's an evolutionary response. Uh, what you do is you dry it out and put it in the fridge overnight. You kind of put it like in a damp paper towel overnight in the fridge, and this works for most seaweeds. And then you plop it back in seawater, and it will almost immediately release all of its spores. And so they do that in, um, in commercial-scale aquaculture. And what they do with this conchocelus, this isn't the best picture of it, but it actually looks like a fuzzy red ball when it's growing. These are microscopic things, but that's kind of when it grows big enough, that's what it looks like. And they occur in um, shells, so like oyster shells and things like that. So they take oyster shells and they release the spores in uh, tanks with oyster shells, and so all the conchocelus is growing. And they grow it throughout the summer, and then they t suddenly change the temperature and the, and the light, and that encourages the growth of these filaments, which release the spores that grow to blades. And so these are actually, uh, because it's an intertidal species, the blades occur in the intertidal, the conchocelus is subtidal, because it occurs for multiple years. So these spores going this way, these zygotospores are actually um, negatively buoyant, so they sink, but these spores float because they're trying to get to the intertidal. So when they release the spores in mass, they have these rotary wheels that they stack nets on top of, and then they just rotate them into the surface of the water because these uh, red algae do not have flagella on their spores. They're non-motile, but they have sticky substances. So as soon as they come in contact with something, they stick. And so that's how they sort of seed the nets with all the nori, and then they put them in the ocean. You presented um, the cultivation of seaweed as a way to deal with the pollution that's produced um, with the, the aquacultural industry um, and as a way to grow food that's protein rich. And I was wondering if, looking more broadly, you'd be able to expand upon your thoughts about the aquacultural industry in general and about some of its pros and cons and whether or not you think it's a, um, an industry that we should continue to um, expand. Mm -hmm. um, so what I will say first is that no farming has no impact, right? So we accept lamb farming because we've been doing it for 10,000 years as something that's normal in our society, but it has quite a lot of ecological consequences. So there is a right way and a wrong way to do things. And I feel like the approach that we have in the states that we up front are trying to address all of these concerns. And that's a lot of the reason why there's been a lot of pushback against aquacultures, because people are worried, and they should be. But if we are doing it in a responsible way, if we're using technologies uh, to prevent you know, escapism, by they, they make most aquaculture fish and shellfish now triploid, so they can't reproduce if there's any sort of thing, like we have that technology now, 
We've increased the feed conversion rate of most fish so that we have to give them less food to get a certain biomass of fish, um, which is actually their ratio is much better than like land-based cattle or hog production. Um, and if we're incorporating either, there has to be some sort of mitigation of the nutrients because the consequences of eutrophication, I mean, you can come visit Narragansett Bay anytime. In the summer, I should have put some pictures in here of what I study now, which are macroalgal blooms, which are massive, and they are a result of wastewater treatment plants and summer homes and sewage systems and et cetera. So we know that we have to do it right. So I think, yes, the aquaculture industry should expand. I'm in favor of land-based production um, because it's, it can be efficient in terms of water use if you're using a system like this. But the capital costs to, to setting up a land-based facility are extreme. And so it's a lot cheaper for people to do it in coastal water. Um, but yeah, certainly if you look up uh, Cook Aquaculture, they're doing commercial scale IMTA where they're growing salmon and mussels and um, kelp together. And you can actually trace through isotope tracing the nutrients coming out of the salmon and being taken up by the seaweed. So we have a ways to go in terms of uh, determining you know, taking into account hydrodynamics and things like that in coastal waters. But I think aquaculture is going to be, at some point, probably the much of the majority of seafood production because we just don't have the wild fisheries anymore. I have a quick question. I was really fascinated yeah. by, by this. And I'm, I can picture the enclosed IMT where you just pass water from here to here to here and back. I'm having a harder time picturing it in the field. Okay. And I was wondering if you could, is it like a pen of salmon surrounded by several radiating pens of, if that's the right term, nets of algae, so that is it, as things diffuse out from the, you know, exactly, what does it look like in the field when yeah. someone tries to set this up? Yeah, it's, that's sort of what it looks like. I, I should have put some pictures in here of that. But um, yeah, so it depends obviously on the hydrodynamics of where you are. But the bay that they're growing it in, for example, the Canada system, yeah, you have, a net, you have multiple net pens of salmon, and those are kind of surrounded by a concentric ring, so to speak, of mussel ropes. So the way that you aquaculture mussel is you get the spat to kind of settle onto a rope that kind of hangs down in the water column, so it's much more of a vertical thing. So those are actually filtering out the solid waste particles from the fish, which don't travel as far, which is why the mussels have to be closer. And then the seaweed lines are a little bit farther away. And so they've sort of been working on this probably for 20 years now, and they've figured out the optimal distance of how well they're going to get the nutrients to extract from the seaweed. And because we have isotopic things, they can isotope spike the food and kind of track it through the, the thing. And they do actually a lot of this with salmon aquaculture in Norway, too. And Europe has m many more aquaculture systems than we do. Really cool talk. So I was wondering, do you see any uh, difference in susceptibility to disease or herbivory in places where they use integrated techniques? For the seaweed, you mean? Yeah. <clears throat> the seaweeds aren't, uh, well, there are diseases not in the US yet, um, certainly in aquaculture. Um, for seaweeds, but so at the nursery stage for nori, the way that you keep it from being fouled by other things and also from getting diseases is that because it's intertidal, you raise the nets out of the water every day when they're little. And so they dry out and they can tolerate drying out, but other things can't. Mm -hmm. So they've shown that that reduces the um, fungal and viral infections, which are the main things, and cyanobacteria also can affect seaweeds. Um, and it also keeps other seaweeds from growing on the net. And then once they're of a big enough size, they don't really have to do that anymore. I didn't see any disease issue. I haven't seen any disease issues with what we're doing yet. We're, it's not a big enough scale that I think it's going to be a problem. How about the fish? Uh, well, there are disease issues with fish, obviously. Right. I mean, they've been dealing with, uh, there were some studies that came out, and I'm not sure what the current state of this research is that showed that um, mus growing mussels with salmon, actually they filter out sea lice, which it can be a major problem in salmon aquaculture. 
Um, but I think most of the issues with salmon aquaculture is that it took people a while to realize that you cannot, you have to let the pens lay foul for a while to get rid of the disease, so they rotate. Mm -hmm. And so that's how they keep the um, anemia from taking over, which has been a real problem in Chile and Maine. That's originally what happened to the Maine aquaculture um, thing. I don't think there's any evidence that seaweeds reduce disease just because they're they're not eating disease organisms, but it's an interesting concept. I mean, it's really, if you think about it, it's more of a mimicking of a natural setting. Like fish don't grow by themselves in the ocean. They grow in an ecosystem with all of these other components. So, so right, that's why I was wondering right. if they would be better off surrounded by... Yeah, I think there's some evidence that the mussels can improve the health of the fish, especially because they're being grown in such large biomasses. I mean, certainly there, there is, I think, only one antibiotic that's approved to use in fish aquaculture, and it's for salmon. Thank you for wonderful talks. I about my coughing fit. Um, two quick questions for you, one easily answerable, one not easily answerable. You've been kind of one of the ways, easily answerable one. When people are talking about oyster aquaculture, they often sell it as oysters are filter feeders. They take stuff we don't want in the water out, and that's great. Um, is there an equivalent line of chat for seaweed? Yes. So oysters are taking out, they're improving the clarity of the water by filtering larger particles out, but seaweeds are taking out the excess nutrients. So, and that's a big problem in coastal, everywhere coastal, mostly. So yeah, there is, there is something to say about that. Obviously, um, <clears throat> part of the process of growing any crop in the ocean is having it tested for things. So for things like heavy metals, there are some seaweeds that accumulate heavy metals and stuff like that. So that's just a quality control type of thing. And that was actually my next question. Okay. <laughs> Anytime you hear about, for example, in the winter, that there's a pulse of spices going into the water that you can measure in the water, like nutmeg and vanilla around winter beverages, and people like to tie that to Starbucks and things like that, I'm going, oh gosh, everything else that's in that water is also going there. So one of my questions yeah. is, are people looking for things like pharmaceuticals, antibiotics, and things like that? as sort of concerns in maintaining the health and the viability of the seaweed industry in the future that's not there or isn't there? Um, I don't think that seaweeds, so seaweeds are actually probably more useful as a source of pharmaceuticals than in terms of being affected by pharmaceuticals because they're not going to be taking up organic compounds. But um, certainly there are some seaweeds that, for example, there was work done down in uh, New Bedford Harbor, which is a super fun site, uh, that the ulva, which is a green macroalgae that grows there, can accumulate PCBs at like 40 times a lethal dose. So that they're very good at, bio that you can use that for bioremediation, right? Instead of dredging the soil, you let it accumulate and you pick the ulva. But um, yeah, so certainly there are some seaweeds that can take up things that we probably don't want them to, but I wouldn't think pharmaceuticals because those are more larger sort of organic molecules. But a lot of seaweeds have antimicrobial, antiviral, antifungal properties. Well, if any of you are interested in greening the oceans, there's a career out there for you. You can be an entrepreneur. You can do research. Thank you again so much for coming Thank and sharing you. your wealth of information. And I'm sure you'd be happy to answer some questions if you want to come up individually afterwards. Of course. Let's give her a big hand.